design doc that we had, or the second one, right? So that's that's why I remember it. <laughs> yeah, B one beta one. Um, so what it was was we said the vast majority of names in the entire of every resource that anyone could ever create should follow the D, the minimal DNS label that we support for pods. Right. For right, because I mean the thinking is that like you never know when these things are going to show up in DNS, right? Right. And then for some resources that people reasonably want to represent, that character set is insufficient unless you do one of two things. Um, you go into um, uh, naming, like uh, like users, users are a good example, groups, um, okay. things that are represented in external systems that you want to map over. And so what we said was the right now effectively there is a default validation rule that's applied to everything, even on CRDs. An API extension server or a, a built-in one could relax that if oh, okay. it goes to. I think. So why we, was it relaxed for RBAC rules? Uh, it's not. No, that's not RBAC. That's um, that's referring to a user, which is not an actual resource in the system. It no, no, no. If you looked at if you looked at the stuff that I don't know, is Jordan. So Jordan, your thing was producing RBAC rules. Where the where the metadata dot name of the RBAC rule had a colon in it. The so when we started with uh, bootstrap oh, yes. rules, um, we were trying to namespace them so that there was a convention that would not conflict with any user generated roles ever. Okay, and so, so you wanted, that's, that's where that's where the system colon yeah, yeah. thing started, and so well, it system was system colon and names makes sense. Uh, yeah, and and so th that's where it. That's where it started. It was system colon is the namespace of system roles. This will never conflict with anything a oh, user right. ever made. I remember seeing that. Yeah, yeah. And then like Cube Adam started doing some roles, and, we were, and they were saying, "What sh what should we call this?" And we we're saying, "Namespace it with something for your tool." And th that's where it started. Yeah. Okay. Now, now it's all stitching together. I remember we seeing update that. identifiers to be clearer. Like uh, Tim yeah. and I fought it out for a long time. Like I agree the the principle of you never know when it's going to show up in a DNS label. And in practice, being restrictive has annoyed a few people, but not a lot of people. So I think it was a success there. And um, also, just to point out the, the namespacing recommendations for like annotations and labels, where you have like a you know DNS name slash some stuff that you control, that doesn't work for names because you right, right, cannot because have slashes and names. Flashes, so, uh, flashes is the one character we probably don't exactly. want. And, and we actually prevent that actively. Go so Go didn't correctly implement URL parsing. Yeah, right. Because no, right, cool. no yeah, like that's that stitches together because I saw that and it's just like, and I, you know, you guys are deeper into the, the RBAC stuff than I am. And I saw it, I'm like, what's going on there? I thought that was the rule, but that makes sense. We should we should clarify that in API conventions and identifiers. It's been a while. All right. Well, so so there is a there is a link in the in the in the agenda now to an issue. This is from Ken. Yeah, Ken. Um, do you want to speak up to that, or actually, before we do that, Brian? Um, I mean, you sort of we're we're sort of collating this effort. Is there anything that you specifically you wanted to cover before we get off in the rabbit hole of something? Uh, well, this is the office hours week, uh, and Ken uh, talked to me. I don't know over a week ago about getting this on the agenda. So I do want to make sure that we get to it. I would also like to keep this meeting short if possible. If there's not a huge agenda item, we made good progress on the proposal process. Uh, I think we could iterate on that more and but the main next step is to try it on something mm -hmm. uh, on some proposal. Uh, I started looking again at the diagrams that map started um, and in particular I need to start uh, putting together some diagrams for my KubeCon talk so um, I was going to work on that and then highest priority for the SIG is uh, the conformance tests. So I actually had some people put together a spreadsheet with a list of the current tests and an English description of what the test is intended to test. And not 100% uh, not of the conformance tests were uh, had that information filled in, but most of them were. Um, is, it was isn't that a SIG testing topic? I thought the conformance stuff was being driven out of SIG testing from... No, so the situation is that the mechanism is SIG testing and vetting what 
uh, should be covered by conformance tests is SIG architecture. Like okay. we define what is, you know, yeah, I mean, that makes ready. sense. I just think this feels like the, this, this, that spreadsheet feels like a little bit on the edge, right? Uh, and the spreadsheet was produced out of SIG testing. Yes. Like the Sonobuoy was used to generate the initial list and then various people. I ultimately, we're going to need a process by which we can push this down primarily to the SIGs. So the SIGs are responsible yeah. for deciding what parts of their functionality should be covered, and then it will just be vetted by SIG architecture. That's kind of the, or escalated. Like there was an escalation, you know, is it valid to have a conformance test that reaches out to the public internet? And that was escalated, and I said, no, it's not valid. We'll figure out a better answer later. Uh, so I, th I think that's the way, in order to scale, that's the way it's gonna need to operate. From reviewing the tests, it is pretty clear that we have major, major uh, issues that need to be addressed with this whole idea. Um, so I'm working on figuring out what to do about that. The first thing that's going to need to happen is going to need to have staffing other than me to go uh, drill down into the problems that have been identified. Yeah, I think as this gets more formal and, you know, there's real there's real skin in the game in terms of sort of what's conformance and you know, what's defined by conformance and what isn't. Um, getting sort of a process that's sort of tracked and accountable there, right? So you, you said you made the call of like, hey, calling out to the internet is not part of conformance because things can run out. Yeah, that was um, actually CC to SIG architecture and nobody else commented. Yeah, it makes sense, right? But I think like we wanna like, like that one is like, all right, yeah, you you know, there's a difference between conformance and, and sort of like debugability and like, you know, um, yes. and so, yeah, so all we did is remove the conformance tag. We didn't yeah, that being said, though, I think, um, I, th I think that we're going to want to, over time, we're going to want to make sure that we're more formal about sort of how we track and vote on that stuff. For, yeah, I mean, arguably, arguably conformance is a definition that needs to be maintained in a doc. Um, and as we accumulate rules and guidelines to a, to a conformance doc, in the, in the high level sense, like, the two things we have is like calling out to the public internet is not because of X. Like that's a good thing that even if we didn't, even if like we want to change that in the future, just recording that we say that's true. The other one that we went through was um, uh, the alpha APIs are not part of a conformance definition. It's a pretty clear cut rule. Yeah. Putting that into a doc is pretty non-controversial, but we just grow the doc to say it, either it's conformant or it's what Kubernetes is, but having a point to edit and accumulate would be good. Yeah, totally. I mean, similar to the um, API reviews and things like that, and we need, and the API conventions, and we need to have some kind of conformance test conventions or guidelines or rules and some reviewers and approvers for that, um, that we have confidence will, you know, yeah. make, apply the rules accurately. Um, this was more of an expedient thing since they're trying to get the conformance program out. And the approach I've taken is be conservative. Like, don't include conformance if we're not confident. But it, we're trying to go to war with the army we have, right? So the approach is, you know, have a set of tests that we're not, that we don't think are totally bogus, um, and start with that, and then improve them over time. Is, um, is everybody on the call OK with the idea of we we deal with this in the short term by you know, the SIG architecture, lazy consensus, and then start trying to turn those into a doc. Yeah, I see, see um, the specific team I think I used or should have used was SIG architecture API reviews or something like that, or maybe PR reviews. But yeah, I think I saw you add that one, yeah. Hey, Quentin, I think you are, something's noisy, I'm trying to figure it out. Yeah, whoever's not talking, just please mute as, thank you. Um, so, so anyway, I, as one would expect, the way those tests were created originally, um, where basically people started with the Intune tests we had and excluded the ones that people believe were non-portable, um, there are a bunch of there are a bunch of gaps. So I actually have a list of reasons for why there are gaps, and some of them are gonna be hard to address. So uh, anyway, I don't quite have a doc on this yet to share, and we will need to 
work with SIG testing. Ultimately, I think we're going to need a new test framework to address the biggest problem uh, or one of the biggest problems. I mean, obviously, the biggest high-level problem is that the set of tests wasn't systematically chosen for this purpose. That's the, that's the high-level problem. But there are some mechanical problems as well, like the set of tests we have is shaped by the fact that the conformance nests need to be run on an end-to-end -end platform. So we use the end-to-end -end test framework. So therefore, the only tests that could be conformance tests are the ones that are not other types of tests. And we actually have a big drive to create more unit tests, more integration tests, more component level tests. And none of those tests are included in the conformance suite. So the set of tests, even looking at the set of tests we have, most of those, if we were writing them today, we would have written them as different kinds of tests. And then the end-to-end -end test would have had almost nothing in it. I can't hear you now, Joe, because now you muted. <laughs> There's a danger here, though, where, where um, a lot of unit tests make assumptions about underlying implementation. They're more white box, right? And I think conformance has to be, has to be more on the black box side of testing, right? So, oh, I agree. And there are okay. issues with the conformance tests as well. Like, we usually try to make end-to-end -end tests tolerate some level of version skew um, and things like that. So I think we need to rethink the mechanism for the conformance tests and the approach. One thing, idea that I was, you know, I was just writing this up this morning, um, but uh, if we could somehow run tests both as unit or integration tests and as end-to-end -end tests, like have a framework that abstracts yeah. the execution model, uh, that could be one way to appro approach this. Uh, like in board, we have some tests that use a uh, client library mock uh, that you can basically completely stub out and directly invoke the functionality, uh, or it could actually do a real API call. Yeah, I, I would All say right. so the advantages. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Clayton. Sorry, man. I was going to say one of the advantages of the, and so like maybe this is like pragmatic versus idealistic, is one of the advantages of the conformance suite is it's, it gets abused all the time, and so it's been smoothed by years of of, um, of repeated runs. I do think there's a pragmatic aspect to the conformance tests, even as they are having gaps, like they're kind of evolvable in the right direction. I would say I'd like to spend the next two years growing that suite and making it more efficient, which benefits everybody, versus like if we Spending too much time on refactoring some classes of tests might hurt. Like, there have been various proposals, like we have integration tests that kind of do some of this, but they're almost a completely different framework with different assumptions. So, yeah. So the set of tests we have right now cover, I think, fewer than 10 uh, areas of the system. Like, there are a ton of config maps tests, a ton of secrets tests, a bunch of projected volume tests. Uh, like, Paul Mori wrote a lot of tests, clearly. Um, basically is what it looks like and nobody else did. So ju just as an example, pod scheduling and execution is not, we don't have a specific test for that. It's only tested accidentally as a side effect of some of the other tests. Um, and so anyway, yeah, I have a bunch, of, I, have, I went through and enumerated categories like tests tested by other types of tests are not covered. Newer functionality is not covered because basically these things were mostly identified at the beginning of time. Um, basic functionality is, is uh, at best accidentally tested. Well, uh, I just meant like in general the, maybe not conformance, but the EDE suites that are on the PR jobs do a reasonably good job. I would, I would almost argue like that slow evolution towards like taking that set and whittling it down is a very pragmatic, like it won't hurt anything to do that because it benefits both sides of the project. Like having yeah. fast, consistent, reliable tests. Less, less expensive. Yeah. So apparently the current test suite costs 50,000 bucks a month to run. Uh, so w w one thing that I think would help be helpful if we could get some clarity again between sort of what this group is doing and what SIG testing is doing. I think as we see questions of what's in and what's out, instead of looking at the specific test, to like, you know, just, you know, can we extract some sort of broader rules then that people can apply, right? And I, I think over time we'll have this definition of like, well, conforming Kubernetes doesn't necessarily have to connect to the internet, but if you don't want to connect to the internet, then to run the conformance test, you have to have these types of set of things, right? Um, and, yeah, and so we are policy and suggesting is mechanism. Yeah, 
Yeah. So like this mechanism of like, how do we actually, like what we can say is like, we prioritize, we'd love to get more coverage over these areas, right? That's sort of a blended type of thing. The actually, like, how do we do that using evolving, you know, integration tests or unit tests or, and that, like that I think is, is maybe more, you know, uh, more in the weeds for us. Uh, I agree. I just wear mini hats. <laughs> so um, anyway, I, I want to let Ken go now. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Please, Ken. Oh, you're muted, man. Can you hear me now? Yeah, all right. So the gist of it is this, right? Uh, deployment and replica set and I believe replication control are all have conditions that are used to communicate status to the end user, right? For the other controllers, daemon set for core workloads, daemon set and staple set, primarily we communicate status using the eventing system and there aren't any conditions. We're gonna try to promote the entire surface to V1. And my concern is that it should be consistent. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about we can kind of remove conditions but keep the same information by spreading them out across the status. Um, there's been a lot of data collection pertaining to the usage. There is, my, my primary concern there is that like removing conditions potentially when migrating from extensions, V1 beta one deployment to V1 deployment could be a significant cost for passes like OpenShift, right? But I still think primarily what our goal should be is to do the right thing and deal with it as opposed to leaving in CRUD that we don't think is a good API and moving forward with it just because it might be difficult. So who, um, like, so I know we've had this kind of, I know there's been the discussion, Brian, that you kicked off, which was you don't think conditions are as useful. So like, I guess like as a, so I see this a lot because we tried to make extensive use of conditions so the big push to get conditions added to all of the APIs came as that second wave as we were going through the exercise of the controllers did not report enough information for a good user experience around actually using deployments, replication controllers, stateful sets, statement sets, et cetera. So we went through that big push last year where we added conditions that reflected like not progressing on replica sets or um, on deployments. Um, and then those showed up in various UIs on our side. We used them a little bit in cube control and a few other places. Um, I don't know if the cube dashboard extensively uses them. Um, do you have data on that, Ken? Uh, I can look, I don't believe it does. Yeah. I think there's a difference between, you know, I totally agree that progressing, for example, is needed in order to build any continuous deployment system on top of deployment, you need to be able to tell, um, you know, make your call of whether it's going to succeed or going to fail. Um, so I, I think we need to distinguish the uh, form in which the information is expressed and which information is expressed. Yeah. To be clear, we're not proposing that we remove any of the communicated information from the well, status, it, right? It's yeah. just a matter of presentation. And to scope it further, I don't think we need to solve whether we want conditions in the API in the general case across the entire service today, I'm talking about the workloads in specific. Does it make sense? Like if it does make sense and perhaps some of this information should be communicated via staple set and daemon set via conditions as well. If not, then we should probably clean up the status of deployment and replica set. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to like, I was, I was trying to frame it in the context of we, we didn't get enough information from controllers. We added it to deployments and replica sets and replication controllers to get more information because at the time that was the that was we use it on nodes, pods, and other lower level things. And then there's various extension things out in the world that use it for things. The workload controllers then are we arguing that like we can't change replication controller, right? Like no matter what, replication controller is locked for the rest of time. Correct. Uh, until until we get rid of it. And so we, we definitely have like a last opportunity. For Do you want to get rid of it, Brian? Uh, yes. So. Oh no, I mean replica set is what I was saying. Okay, sorry. <laughs> oh, I. Yeah, I mean, so just. I, we don't want to go into this. No, no, no. So, sorry. I, thought, I, I I heard replica set, and I'm like, you want to get rid of replica set? Was what I heard. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> that would be surprising to me. So <laughs> we have a mechanism that works on pods and nodes. Let's say pods because that's like a touch point that everybody's always going to deal with. Like 
we're not going to change it off pods either. No, it's just good, it's moving to taints and tolerations. But we still have them on a V1 API. So if we change that, we break everybody who's built integration around nodes. That, that's what yeah. I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a while, but all of the V1 APIs have to move into API groups. So we're going to have an opportunity and to change the schema. I mean, it will take a couple of years to migrate so, off. So that's kind of what I was saying is like, uh, we have a pattern today. It has deficiencies. We have a last opportunity for some of these core ones to set to avoid a big cost. I guess the question I have is introducing a net new pattern is going to make Kubernetes harder to use and write for, for things that already exist when you're going to have two different ways of getting this. I, I, there's some level of, well, I know we want to evolve cube over time. Is it worth it? So in terms of the, is it worth it? I, so this has come up in service catalog and other uh, API reviews, but service catalog is kind of interesting because it mostly other than Paul involved a lot of people who are new, relatively new to Kubernetes and they, uh, I mean, Doug maybe can speak to this, but they reasonably struggled with making a decision about what should be status versus what should be a condition. It is like hard to explain. Uh, and, you know, the analysis that Eric and I did showed that actually a lot of, most of the information in most of the conditions and most of the APIs that use conditions, uh, the information is not well utilized and it just makes the whole structure cumbersome. Uh, and it makes certain things hard, actually hard to express, like indexing into a index structure in a way that's non-indexed. In, non you actually have to search for a key um, it's just really hard to sure. express in a lot of forms and the original way that we expected it to be used where like the conditions would be generically uh, propagated to clients to understand what was going on mostly was not happening other than for nodes. Um, okay, so, so I wanted to ask, so, um, so, any, so anyway, my, I guess part of my point here is that there's an ongoing cost to both users and people writing APIs to make decisions about what, what should be expressed as conditions versus not. And that ongoing cost seems to be pretty high from what so, I can tell. Well, but I would, I would maybe make the argument that we have a mechanism. We actually aren't investing in improving that mechanism, right? So we, we went halfway, we added them, but then we didn't use it, um, except in describe in a few other places. If we change the mechanism, we're not going to have less work. We're going to have more work because we'll have to continue improving the old things that we can't get rid of and then add new things that people have to come up with new patterns for and so for two years or so we'll have two different patterns is changing the pattern like so just like at a really high level is changing the pattern worth it given that we have existing data or do we drive to conclusion and say at some point in the future we'll come back like doing it now for workloads actually creates more work for anybody building clients because they have two different ways to do it for workloads and for pods or whatever is that worth it like i'm just asking like because i think this is a really fundamental well, pods have the additional problem that the conditions are woefully inadequate like you can, there's no way you can look at the conditions and really report anything useful about the pods alone like if you look at print pod base in cube control, it actually does this really complicated thing where it walks the containers and pulls container status um, and, and looks at phase and looks at other information. Honestly, that needs to be moved into code into kubelet to usefully summarize well, so, the status. So I would say for nodes and for pods, the conditions are pretty useless as is. Well, so. Uh but we expose it and they have information that various clients are using. I guess like useless is a strong statement because people use it to go figure out what they're doing. I guess like I'm worried that we're saying we're going to go create a new better thing that also needs to have all this work done and we're going to have two ways to do it over time. But in a couple of years, we'll have a better mechanism that's consistent versus like I'm kind of making the argument. Why don't we? So I think you know. I'm scared that we're already leaning too much on events for a lot of this stuff. I mean, one of the proposals yes. is user. So I consider events 
completely useless for pragmatic UIs because it requires you to do a very complex lookup and correlation. Part of the reason, whatever it is, like message and reason, the reason that they're very useful on the objects is because a naive client can look at them and see data and then report it to a user. I totally agree. We have to keep reason. We have to have something, yeah, reason and something like message or something that's human approachable. If we don't have that, we're going to have to go add it. I just, like, that's what I worry about. Like, I, I guess, I, I mean, so it seems to me, and, and you guys have, I think, thought about this more than me, is that there's an analog here between annotations and, like, having, like, explicit fields in spec versus conditions and having explicit fields in status, right? And we have this trade-off between extensibility of being able to expose all sorts of random ass things without having to, to plummet through the API versus strong typedness. And, and like, just like there's always going to be a time and a place for annotations, you know, as, as ways to sort of tunnel through, um, even if we're not happy about it, right? I, I, it feels like maybe we need like the you know annotations for status also. Well, so this is another thing we have never really used that aspect of conditions to plumb through arbitrary stuff that the system doesn't know. And if we did, then now we have a documentation problem where but we have a the, documentation the things, problem with the things are not self-documenting. Like people say, "What the hell is crash loop back off mean?" Right, and well, then we have no documentation. Of that. That's that's kind of thing. The reason that's associated. The reason that's associated with these conditions, people are using it like trying to build a state machine off of it. And it's really just an arbitrary string. It's not an enumeration. So the reason in theory can change arbitrarily at any given time and break your client. Message you definitely shouldn't be depending on the specific, specific content for. All the other fields of status have clearly defined semantics that are like, this is what it means. These are the allowable values. This is the default, right? Yeah. So conditions are still like, arbitrarily the aggregated events that are stuffed into the status. Well, no, there's a difference between events and conditions in that conditions are a level. It's an ongoing thing where, where events are a, a point in time type of thing. And I think one of the problems right. is when we try and represent conditions into events, they can roll off or get GC'd or you have to search to actually sort of figure out begin and end, right? And so I think they're, they're, they're very different things. And I think as we move towards like say more implementations behind CRI, we're gonna have more ways where we're gonna to wanna to bubble up sort of special purpose things about sort of pod status that are, you know, and, and like, like if we don't have something like conditions, we're not gonna be able to do that. I think Joe, you hit it on the head, which is it is like annotations. It's not that it's like, maybe the argument here that I would make would be every new, like the discoverability of conditions that are of, um, of fields is better. What we really, should be doing is looking for the opportunities to turn core behavior that we think conditions represent into status fields. This seems very like weird. crash loop back off should probably be a status field. Well, so we're missing the most important status condition of all. And like 99% of all users hit this, which is there's crash loop back off, but it's actually the thing is what is this pod doing right now? Is it pulling? I right, right, yeah, yeah, pull error, right? It's like, ever okay, so actually, your name is Horked, right? It's like, that is a hard Actually, thing. I think uh, Clayton just hit on something, which is maybe we should recommend to put um, very important, stable, uh, dependable behaviors as fields, right? Things that everybody needs to know, things that are not going to go away. Those, those should be the lowest common denominator stuff is fields. Yep. And the conditions will be for, ex for kind of extension like mechanisms or, you know, the CRI plugins or volume plugins or things like that to report information. I think we should officially uh, recommend to get rid of the last updated, last heartbeat, last whatever fields that mostly don't, people don't use. And when they do, it ends up uh, having a huge cost uh, performance wise. Um, so prune the set of information to the set of information that's actually useful and then write a style guide similar to what Merrick and I are doing with events. Yeah. Find a way to use conditions as a way of um, exposing useful information that the use case, the fact that someone has exposed it in conditions and that it has persisted and people consume it is a reason it should go to a field Arguably, we could treat it as well as the way that we bring status information through an alpha beta style transition, which is 
the organic approach. I, I, Joe, your point about annotations is I do think of conditions like annotations. Um, we didn't see a lot of use of annotations for the first two years of Kubernetes. And now I think... Now we have too much. When I look at systems, yeah, like there's, there's a huge dependency on annotations. Like I see lots of people using annotations on services to control behavior. We would like Expose take... Expose controller. Yeah, exactly. And it's like a... What, like what, I'm sorry? Expose controller. People put annotations on services and use that to automatically program ingresses. To me, this is actually a sign that ingress is factored wrong, but... Um, yeah, I, I, I think... So, so, but there are, I mean, there are places where it's like, if you look at, at like the ELB integration for AWS or like, there's like, like there's so much like, like tunable knobs for ELBs and there's no other way to get those parameters in versus something like annotations. So I'm not sure that we have. Well, for that, there's a discussion going on about whether we should use a CRD for that. Um, yeah. But even, even in the absence of that, um, the, it's a little bit like the argument for CRD, which is the barrier to attaching data that provides real value for your automation is so much better than every, like the one thing that differentiates cube from every other API I've ever used in my entire life is I can work around the API designers flaws and I can find value. Like, like we are, we are all human. We all have flaws. Like we have, there's a ton of great ideas in the cube API. It is far from perfect annotations, labels, some of the other mechanisms we have actually give us a mechanism whereby people can find value above and above the system. And we don't want to take that away. We just want to say, we're going to formalize it and we shouldn't abuse annotations. Like we learn not to abuse annotations ourselves. Whoa. So I, th I, think we, I think we have an answer actually for Ken, which is the existing set of conditions we have that we know are useful. We should convert to fields but we should leave conditions in and fix it uh, to fix some of the problems that we've identified. So but we may not have like, any conditions in the beginning that we actually populate that array with. So I would here, I have two, two things. One, the main problem with annotations, when you're used appropriately, I don't see a problem, but when you use annotations with the intention of promoting it to a field later, we don't really know how to do that without causing breaking changes. So my concern would be, would be like if we use conditions as a general mechanism to incorporate arbitrary status and if it becomes important, we promote it into a field later, that we think about it enough so that we know we know how to do it without breaking backward compatibility during that promotion. But again, Actually, for status, we do know how to do it, Ken. Okay. It's and only for spec that's impossible. I would say the lesson we learned from annotations to API fields is no matter what, we will break people. And so... <laughs> there is, it, is, it is impossible to migrate APIs. If so you have an application, it's an API, it's going to cost people. We just need to minimize the cost we put on our users by being very clear about how we communicate and then encouraging them to do the right thing. So like people abusing available today are doing it because they have no other way to get that information and it's a fundamental gap in the system. The, there's, there's some level of, I don't know that we should just add status fields willy nilly because of the concern about like, we need to be somewhat cautious. And so in that balance, it's at a condition when we are unsure whether it is something that is informational versus status, use that, that to guide us. And we'll break, like people will get broken depending on conditions, just like people get broken depending on annotations. We just have to communicate that appropriately and say, you know, here's what we expose. These may change, et cetera. And, and I think, you know, technically we can, you know, which is, technically we can be correct, which is the best kind of correct um, <laughs> by saying that, like, you know, that, that conditions and, and annotations are not part of the API and the API promises around V1 and beta and all, you know, GA, right? They, they are exempt. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a wild west. Um, if we took available out, we would break a lot of real world systems. Um, we'll have to think about that on our side, but we need to set the tone for like, no matter what. Well, if, if that's a field, then in the, yeah, I mean, like, in the conditions, like the moment, like if we stopped setting available as a condition today, we would break production workloads. Well, I think we should only do that across API versions in this case. Yeah. And, and that's a great example. It's like, we'll promise to be stable for the ones we have today. We will introduce new fields. When we introduce new fields, we'll give you a warning and a deprecation notice and a time period. You'll transition over. We 
reserve the right to add new conditions, um, new conditions added from here on out or something like that. Like maybe we should put it in, like we know the conditions, they're in the API docs already. We should in the API docs for a status, uh, for the status thing say, here's the conditions that are stable, all other conditions um, may change without notice or something like that. So, yeah, so I think we've arrived at a, at a good place. Do you think you have your answer, Kenny? Well, let me just put this out there. What I'd like to do for V1 then is this. I'd like to add staple set conditions as part of the field, not populate it with anything, but leave it there for future growth if we want to actually potentially use them later. It should be part of the V1 API so we don't have to add an entire type to the field. I'd like to do the same thing for daemon set. Yes. Again, not populate it until we find an actual use for it. Wait, wait, wait. Deployment yeah. alone, as is, don't do any work on it, but potentially we can always add to status without breaking backward compatibility and promote existing conditions later and just reserve the right to do that. So you're saying not add conditions to V1? No, add, add the conditions structure to V1, but don't actually populate any conditions because all the conditions we have, we believe should be fields. Sure. And then, but we can add them later and do nothing for deployment, continue using conditions there, defer promotion or conditions to status in deployment, and in replica set until later. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Okay. Um, what about ready and available? I think those should just be fields. So we can do that, but my only thought is that, you know, it's a short quarter, short release cycle. Nothing stops us from doing that after V1 because it's a non-breaking backward compatible change. Uh, no, it's going to be breaking effect. It's going to be effectively breaking because we're going to want to not populate those in in the conditions array. So any clients that are built on that will be broken. Is if there any cost to populating the fields, We have to do it. Is there a cost to populating them? I mean, like at the end of the day, like pragmatically, I like we're treating V1 like a cliff. I guarantee you that no one who's using deployment yeah. today thinks of deployments as anything other than V1. And they, they're gonna wanna change a couple things, but if you like, don't, I mean, we shouldn't kick people. Like we should, we should poke them or prod them. Like there's some like level of, I don't know how, like I would say we could err on duplicating data. Having conditions and fields be um, uh, duplicated doesn't worry me at all. Okay. I was, I, I, I was kind of, I mean, thought, cool. like, we can keep it and I'm not saying we never get rid of it, but you can keep it for say, okay, we're, we're adding this status field for the next several releases. We'll continue populating the condition. And then when we're comfortable removing it and people have moved off of it, we can do it that way. I'm also okay with doing a couple of them now. I don't think it's like that much of the, the LOE isn't so high that we can't get it done. I think the critical ones should be fields. So, so here's one, here's one approach that we can take here is that we can, and that this means better schema annotations and stuff like that, but we can say, Hey, for this type, this field is actually exposing this condition. And then you can collect those for the type and you can actually mask those conditions when people are listing stuff. So they don't see the same information twice, but it's actually there. So like there's a tool ability fix to actually have this data twice and be able to deal with it over the long term without confusing users. The, the other thing I'd like to point out though is because we're not deprecating, well we've deprecated it, but because we're not actually removing the storage format for extensions V1, um, we can't entirely remove the condition, right? Well, we're even though we have, because, yeah. because it has information in it. Yeah. And, yeah, that's a good point. So, I mean, like, e e we're going to keep this condition even if we add the status field. Like, it's not going away, at least until extensions V1 beta 1 is completely removed. My argument would be we're in the point of Cube's life cycle where changes are going to take two years to propagate through, and we should be, yeah. we should slow, like, slow API. Um, and like just like slow food is you got to be predictable and it just it's going to take longer and cost more Yep. Okay, so I think I uh, so, so I think the other the main unresolved uh, Issue with the field question is what should the fields look like? I don't think we have a satisfactory Answer to that you mean uh, the fields in condition or or as yep. conditions get promoted just as uh, vanilla status fields Okay, yeah, yeah, the crash loop back up. Is it a bool, right? I mean, or is it, you know, well, yeah. I mean, that one is uh, kind of special and different because it's a container level thing, not a pod level thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but taking a simpler example, just ready or available from the, from the conditions, um, 
it's super useful to have a reason, even as a field. So I had previously suggested that we have them be strings, the non-enumeration flavor strings, much like the reason field, but just be called uh, ready or available or things like that. The problem is that there needs to be a well-known, uh, the general pattern of these things is that it's either, you're either good, in which case there's no real reason, or you're not good, in which case there are lots of unbounded numbers of reasons. Um, expressing these as where you have like empty string in the good case means that they're all have to be, the fields all have to be expressed in the negative, like not ready, not available, whatever. Um, so I suggest we don't do that. It ends up being really awkward. Um, and so, this sounds like a great topic for a proposal slash design doc. Well, but that's what I was saying. Like, based on this idea that we're going to keep conditions, add empty conditions for a stateful set and daemon set at least, for the workloads API allows us to take design proposals later for exactly what the status field should be. So that's why I'm saying it's not possible though, Ken. Like, because, well, okay. If we keep all the existing conditions forever, then in clients built on those don't immediately have to adopt the status fields. Okay, yeah, I, I'm, I'm fine with it now. We're basically saying that we're going to keep all existing conditions. But you're saying, well, so, so your argument is that we can never remove the condition, even if we promote it to a status field and give people some level of time to catch up with it. Yes. What I would say is that is that technically, again, the best kind of correct. We probably could because it, you know that list of, of stuff is not formally part of the the v1 promise and the but pragmatically it's probably not a good idea that's for the current set of conditions so every change we do is going to take time away from take valuable time away from other things we want to go fix as well like in terms of any any effort we spend on removing conditions has to be worth the return because like Ken and I and other people like McCullis, like other people, Janet will go and will be spending time fixing breaks on that. Whereas we probably want to go spend time on like, adding maybe, value. <laughs> yeah, like we yeah. sort of apply. Yeah. And, and yeah. so uh, that's kind of a, a mental model there problem. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm, I'm fine with it. I agree that we do need a, uh, we'll need a proposal, but my current thinking is, express them in the positive, don't express them in the negative. We'll come up with a sentinel string or something for the good case that is uniform across all the conditions. Um, well, again, so I think there's two issues here. The, so there's number one is the idea that conditions are sort of like status annotations. We want to promote them to being re refields. That seems like a good thing to put a pin in. The second thing is like when we do promote these things to fields, what is the form? How do we actually do it? I think that's going to be a case by case thing. I'd love to see, you know, something written down that we can explore because I feel like yeah, Brock this, has like this, five plans in his head of different ways we can do this. And it's not obvious to me. <laughs> the stuff that's written down is in the issue. I just posted it. Eric and I posted pretty long analyses of the situation to that. And there's some follow on discussion. Okay. Oh, this is from, oh, this is a Senate thread from 2015? No, no, it's a recent Senate thread. Uh, it's not actually a Senate thread, but it's, it's uh, like within the past month and a half. Okay, because the original issue is 2015. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, you have the Sorry, you go. Do you have the link to the uh, post you mentioned? Can, can you please post it here? Because it's, it's going to be difficult to dig it out. I'm sorry, which one I just posted to the chat? Uh, no, no, you, you mentioned uh, you uh, posted it to the thread, the architecture thread. Uh, well, there, and there's, I don't remember saying that, but there's, um, Eric Tuner and I posted to the issue. Um, okay. So, the also the link in the document has refs to seven eight five six fifty seven ninety eight um, community six like all of them are referenced from that thread so kind yeah, of there, aggregates. There was there Paul Mori had a proposal open to refine the language on phase and conditions in the API conventions doc, 
And that's where some of this uh, actually started. That came out of Service Catalog. Yeah, that's uh, Community 606, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so can you, um, where are you gonna write up the decision, Ken? I'll just put it in the original issue and uh, probably close the issue with that. Um, well, we need to update the API conventions, I think. Uh, okay, we can, we can, generally my way would be to close this issue and open another issue that specifically says we're gonna update the API conventions, but we can extend the issue that's currently there to capture the context if that's what everybody wants to do. Yeah. Okay. I think we should do that. So I had one that's along a similar line, um, which was, uh, I think we're getting a lot of pressure right now to graduate uh, extension mechanisms because we've said everybody should use the extension mechanisms and it's putting a lot of pressure on the extension mechanisms to move to beta maybe faster than is safe. And this is kind of a project level trade-off that I think needs to be kind of um, discussed a little bit here. So concrete example, initializers and dynamic emission, uh, mutate webhooks emission, um, fairly complex. Uh, we did the alpha version in 1.7. In 1.8, we found more issues and put some strategic fixes in and moved it along a little bit further. In 1.9, we're having a discussion in SIG API machinery about how far do we go. Um, what I noticed at the discussion is that a lot of people want to go use initializers and webhook. At the same time, we're saying, because this is such a fundamental part of the system, we're not sure we're going to get it right the first time. And the sort of balancing act between we forced everybody or told everybody that the only way you get to extend is through this mechanism that you don't have yet. Um, how as a project do we feel about setting the, the expectations for beta early? Like, do we want to go to beta knowing that there may be issues that we're gonna have to deal with in beta? Or would we want to push off longer? For this particular case, I think there are a few, con a few concerns. Um, and I know I'm gonna actually try to come to the API machinery discussion uh, on this you. Um, I am concerned that in alpha they're not going to get adequate usage to discover the issues that we might be concerned about. So I don't really see an alternative. I think we can just, we could potentially identify a subset of the functionality and say, look, we're going to take this functionality to beta so we can at least get that feedback with initializers versus mutable webhooks. Specifically, I think it does deserve a discussion about the trade-offs, I think the biggest concern with respect to initializers really is, are we going to keep it or get rid of it in favor of mutable webhooks? If we think we're going to keep it, then we should find a way to get a subset of the functionality to beta so it can get real testing to surface additional issues that we won't get without real usage. Yeah. And I think they... Um, Go ahead. Oh, I was going to just say, you know, a forcing function on this is going to be the release cycle for 1.9 is going to be pretty short. and the time that people would be reviewing any of this functionality that's going to be included in 1.9 is going to be during the holidays, which is uh, traditionally the lowest uh, input time for any kind of uh, extended use. People don't want to be changing. They don't want to be doing it over the holidays. So um, it seems like 1.9 would be a great time to do any hardening around the existing functionality as opposed to adding more into it. Um, and then look at uh, any kind of feature richness or expansion in 1.10 starting in, in 2018. Yeah, I think the hardening is what people were uh, looking to do in terms of getting into beta, fixing performance issues, cor uh, correctness issues, sorting out uh, semantic aspects that weren't well documented, uh, things of that nature, you know, actually make it is what has been built be usable for some set of scenarios um, so that we can get that real world, some amount of real world usage. And with beta, we try to make it stable such that we can evolve the API in a forward compatible way. I mean, we might, might need to rev the beta version. Like I said, I think the biggest question is how confident are we that we're gonna keep the mechanism uh, in anything remotely resembling its current, current form. If we have reasonable confidence, you know, it doesn't have to be, it's never gonna be 100% confidence. If we have reasonable confidence, then we should try to make it to beta. If we think, no, this was a bad idea, we need to rethink it, 
that's a different kind of consideration. Uh, and we should, on this particular issue, specific issue, we should discuss an API machinery, but the general uh, thing with alpha is that it doesn't get adequate usage in order to vet ideas. Yeah, so, I mean, like, like stateful sets, we could conceivably put this in the category of things that we want longer soak time on. Um, but we do, we, we would prefer that people are using it versus people are not. And so setting a reasonable expectation that the first few releases of beta, um, we, we run with a little bit larger caveats than normal, which is we may have the need to do something somewhat dramatic on them. Do we want to have like red beta, yellow beta, green beta? I, I mean, stateful sets were, were like that. We put stateful sets out there and we said, we're pretty sure this isn't going to eat your data. Thanks, Ken. See you later. Ken leaves right as we start talking about staple sets. Um, <laughs> and the eating the data part was what we were very concerned with. Um, CRD and third party resources are another example. Um, we've had a really long beta for deployments. Yeah, I mean, hey, deployments has been beta since 1.2. Brandon, um, did you have something you wanted to say? Uh, just reminding everyone that we do have pretty clear beta definitions. Um, and if we just need to make sure that we don't compromise on those if we're if we're rushing stuff through. I don't think the beta definitions are crazy, um, but like Clayton said, it's it's not eat your data and reasonableness that your cluster will stay up. I think we're just in this like we want our cake and we want to eat it too. We want people to actually use the stuff, but we also want to be able to change it later. Well, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, on Brandon's point, I Eric and I wrote the current ver version of the, the definitions for alpha, beta, and stable. So I think I understand the intent pretty well. Um, you know, it says support for overall feature will not be dropped, though details may change, right? We're going to make pretty significant efforts to make it forward compatible and convertible. Um, but we will sometimes screw it up, right? So I think this fits. Okay, so is some of this, that. okay. Okay, is it just a thing of naming? I mean, like if we called, it's not. It's not naming. No, no, no. Because people hear beta, and people have like, you will not use beta features. I blame so it's beta in terms of in terms of shape, but it's not beta necessarily in terms of stability. It's not beta in terms of uh, in terms of of long term commitment, right? So it's there is a long term commitment to the feature. There are certain betas that are stable, like deployment stable, right? in terms of like it doesn't break. Well, there, there are pathological cases where- They're does. always like, those are bugs, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, but yeah. I, I think like we're trying to set, like I, this, this tension around beta, we've had this over two, the last two releases. We, we want to make sure that we are getting people the ability, and like some of this is artificial we create for ourselves, which is don't turn on alpha. We, we're gonna iterate, but we don't iterate enough, so we want beta. We set the bar. We just, I think we, we may want, like, the, to Joe, your point, like, I think we're trying to get a little bit better about how we communicate to both the internal teams working on Cube, the community, as well as the people consuming it, what the reasonable expectation is, is, like, we're doing this so that you can use it. We're going to, as uh, Brandon said, like, we're going we're gonna to provide these guarantees, but you need to understand that beta means beta. It, would, it could change. We're going to do it in this fashion. And we want to, we want you to know, like in release notes aren't enough, like we want you to know when you're using the feature that you're going to have to think about some of these things if you start adopting it. Yeah, I think the, the, things, um, the things that were alpha in the past, like just take deployment as an example, had some pretty severe implementation problems, known functionality gaps. Um, we knew we were going to break the API, specifically with the initial deployment. We used the old label selector, and we knew we were going to change it in a non-backward compatible way that couldn't be addressed by conversion. Um, so there were like very strong reasons for making deployment alpha when it was alpha. The, and we intentionally disable alpha APIs by default, both because we don't want people to get hurt accidentally using something that they shouldn't be relying on, uh, but also because they don't have an upgrade story. Like we have a st pretty strong rule that production clusters need to be upgradable in some kind of mostly automated fashion. Um, and alpha APIs deliberately violate that. Like they're in a 
state in their implementation where they're not ready for that. Right. Okay, so I don't think anybody's arguing with the idea of beta, Brian. I think, I think the question is, is that the definition of beta in Kubernetes is incredibly conservative compared to beta in a lot of other places. And there are, what's that? Like Gmail. Yes, beta. that's right. I am GA. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but like, I, I, I think there are a lot of people who write policy assuming the wide sort of broader definition of beta. Yeah, like it's not officially supported by customer support. Right, and so is our, is our definition. Honestly. Right, so like I, I'm just like, like I think I think our, our 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 categorization is correct. I think the communication and the naming and what those name implies actually puts us at somewhat of a disadvantage for this stuff. Right, I'll look at some of the support like that. I'm not going to name names that a project came out a couple of weeks ago and like I poked like four holes into it and like the response I got back is like, oh, well, it's still very early, but it's marked as like a GA, no alpha, no beta type of label. And it's like, what the hell dudes, right? So like we take this stuff really seriously and that's good, but I don't think, I think everybody assumes that we're actually using beta to mean the same thing that everybody else means beta. We could change the labels to, to uh, be like truth in advertising. Instead of beta, we can call it six month deprecation. Uh, I, I, okay, so I think it might be worthwhile to actually um, think about, can we condense this stuff into a chart that really clearly gets across what are the qualities of beta here? Consider like, I don't, we probably can't change the name beta, but like, but you know, maybe have some statement about like how we're not doing great inflation, even though everybody else is, right? So I definitely think one thing we need to do that document, uh, I guess now is on Kubernetes.io, which is good. It didn't used to be, um, but yeah, and we could add some kind of clarifying statement there. And by we, I think someone who's not Brian, who already has so many things to do that every time Brian says, I got another doc, I think the rest of us need to step up and say, we're going to go help push that over if we care enough. Yeah, I mean, it's true that any uh, hour I spend on anything is time that blocks other people for weeks, potentially, because that's an hour I won't be able to get back for a long time. Yeah. So, Joe, maybe you, me, Brandon could spend some time on this. Do we want to, like, schedule something? Anybody else who's interested wants to join? Sure, add it to the pile. I think it's a good, I mean, it's a good thing that needs to be done. Um, I, I do think that we... It's it's a Google beta versus a <laughs> versus a, you know rest of the world beta. Okay, so that that, right. that basically is the the concern I wanted to raise, which is we just start to formalize this definition more so that the community and everyone else gets a little bit clearer on panic around calling it beta. Yeah, I I would say that shorter is sweeter here if we can actually sort of augment the the definitions with a little diagram or a little chart or I, something. I, th I think a chart with the columns and check boxes would be awesome. Like yeah. It's, it doesn't have to be huge. Like a column with a deprecation period, a column with you get this property, a column with you get that property, and a check or an X in the, in the column. Something and, like. and, and from the chat log, I see that Matt wants to get involved too. <laughs> yeah. Um, who can take point on scheduling something? I, I think this is important enough to, and we also need to acknowledge that we probably made some mistakes, like deployments being in beta for a year or more. Actually, that wasn't really a, mis a mistake in that the reason we did that is so that we could get the other workload APIs all have the APIs in sync and move uh, advance in the uh, coherent API group version together. It was understaffed, which right. made that take so long. Yeah, maybe not mistake, but things that are historically we haven't done in line with the new definition of beta. And actually, the, whatever we do, when we write this up, we should give examples based on the history of the project and how right. we applied these rules and how we're going to do better. Right. So I'll, I, Brandon, I'll take that. I'll send something to SIGAR, which we'll start. We'll call for times next week. Okay. Thanks, Clayton. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of your day.